As a worker, being aware of the hazards around you is paramount to your safety. One of the most hazardous circumstances in the workplace today is the risk of falling. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, falls account for 8% of all occupational fatalities from trauma. In the U.S., falls are the leading cause of worker fatalities in the construction industry. On average, between 150 and 200 workers are killed, and more than 100,000 are injured as a result of falls. This program is intended to provide training for both construction and manufacturing employees who are exposed to fall hazards. The contents of this video will cover OSHA standards, general fall protection requirements, general industry requirements, construction industry requirements, types of fall protection, personal fall arrest system, training requirements. Although there are a variety of OSHA standards covering general industry and the construction industry, this training program will highlight CFR 1910 subpart D for general industry and CFR 1926 subpart M for the construction industry. Although the mandates are similar, there are some differences. Fall protection must be provided for each employee on a walking, working surface with an unprotected side or edge at the height required by the OSHA standard applicable to their workplace. In general industry, the elevated height level is 4 feet or more above a lower level. In the construction industry, OSHA mandates employers to protect employees from fall hazards and falling objects whenever the employee is six feet or more above a lower level. In some construction situations, the height requirement for protection can be different. It is important to know which OSHA regulation is applicable to your work environment and to provide fall protection when required. Employers must provide protection for employees who are exposed to the hazards of falling into dangerous equipment regardless of height. These requirements are based on systems and procedures designed to prevent employees from falling off, onto, or through working levels and to protect employees from being struck by falling objects. Anytime an employee is working four feet above a lower level, fall protection must be provided. The four-foot rule applies, but is not limited to unprotected sides and edges, hoist areas, holes, and runways or similar walkways. OSHA allows employers the flexibility to select and provide the fall protection they determine will be the most effective in the particular workplace operation or situation to protect their workers and prevent injuries and fatalities from occurring. Employers can choose from a number of protection options. A guardrail system, which is a barrier erected along an unprotected or exposed side, edge, or other area of a walking, working surface to prevent workers from falling to a lower level. A safety net system, which consists of a horizontal or semi-horizontal cantilever-style barrier that uses a netting system to stop falling workers before they make contact with a lower level or obstruction. A personal fall arrest system that arrests or stops a fall before the worker contacts a lower level. It consists of a body harness, anchorage, and connector, and may include a lanyard, deceleration device, lifeline, or a suitable combination. The use of body belts as part of a personal fall arrest system is prohibited. Other options include a positioning system, a travel restraint system, and a ladder safety system. 
If the employees are exposed to falling objects, appropriate head protection must be provided and worn. In addition, employers must protect employees from falling objects by implementing one of the following. Erect tow boards, screens, or guardrail systems to prevent objects from falling to a lower level. Erect canopy structures and keep potential falling objects far enough from an edge, hole, or opening to prevent them from falling to a lower level. Or, the employer can barricade the area into which objects could fall, prohibiting employees from entering and keeping objects far enough from an edge or opening to prevent them from falling to a lower level. Regardless of height, open-sided floors, walkways, platforms, and or runways above or adjacent to dangerous equipment must be guarded with a standard railing and tow board. All floor openings measuring 12 inches or more in smallest dimension should be covered or guarded to prevent a person from falling or stepping into the area and or materials from falling into the area. Floor openings include skylights, stairways, ladderways, hatchways, pit and trap doors, manholes, and temporary floor openings. Every floor hole should also be guarded by either a standard railing with tow board or a cover of sufficient strength and construction. Employers must determine if the walking or working surface has the structural strength to support employees and their tools safely before employees can begin work. Once the employer has determined the surface is safe to work on, they must provide appropriate fall protection if a fall hazard is present. Areas or activities where fall protection is needed and the type of protection required includes, but isn't limited to, unprotected sides and edges, guardrail, safety net, or personal fall arrest system, or PFAS, leading edge work, guardrail, safety net, or PFAS. When it is unfeasible or creates a greater hazard to use these systems, an employer may develop and implement a fall protection plan. Holes, which include unprotected skylights, PFAS, covers, or guardrail. Formwork and reinforcing steel, PFAS, safety net, or positioning device system, ramps, runways, and other walkways, guardrail, excavations, guardrail, fences, barricades, or covers, overhand bricklaying and related work, guardrail, safety net, PFAS, or controlled access zone, roofing work on low slope roofs, guardrail, safety net, PFAS, or a combination of warning line system and guardrail system, safety net system, PFAS or safety monitoring system. Roofs less than 50 feet in width may use a safety monitoring system alone. Residential construction, guardrail, safety net, or PFAS. When it is unfeasible or creates a greater hazard to use these systems, an employer may develop and implement a fall protection plan. Wall openings, guardrail, safety net, or PFAS. To protect employees from falling objects, employers must ensure employees wear hard hats and erect tow boards, screens, or a guardrail system, or erect a canopy structure, or barricade the area to which objects could fall. OSHA has established fall protection requirements for many specific situations, such as hoist areas, runways, areas above dangerous equipment, wall openings, repair pits, and scaffolding. OSHA gives employers several fall protection options from which to choose, but in general, it is better to use fall prevention systems like guardrails rather than fall protection systems, such as safety nets or fall arrest devices. Employers can choose from the following fall protection options, but whatever choice is made, make sure you are using fall protection as required by OSHA. One option is a guardrail system. 
OSHA requirements for guardrails state the top rail must be between 39 and 45 inches above the walking or working surface, be at least one quarter inch thick, and be able to withstand a force of at least 200 pounds applied within two inches of the top edge in any outward or downward direction at any point along the rail. When using cable as a top rail, it must be flagged at not more than six feet intervals with high visibility material. The mid rail must be one half the distance from the walking surface to the top of the top rail and be at least one quarter inch thick. Intermediate members, mid rails and screens must be able to withstand 150 pounds of pressure in any outward or downward direction. Intermediate vertical members must be installed no more than 19 inches apart. Guard rails surfaces must be smooth. Rails should not extend past a terminal post. Guardrails around access areas must have a self-closing gate that slides or swings away from the hole or the point of access and must be offset to prevent accidental walking into the hole. The gate should be in place at all times except when access area is being used. Another option safety net systems should be installed as close as practicable under the walking working surface and never more than 30 feet below such levels. Maximum size of each net mesh opening must not be longer than six inches on any side. Nets must have a border rope for webbing with a minimum breaking strength of 5,000 pounds. Safety nets must be drop tested at the job site after initial installation and before being used as a fall protection system whenever relocated, after major repair, and at six month intervals if left in one place. Nets should be inspected weekly for wear, damage, and or deterioration. Defective nets, components, should be removed from service. Objects which have fallen into the safety net, such as debris and tools, must be removed as soon as possible. Covers are another type of fall protection and should be used to keep employees from falling through holes in walking, working surfaces and be able to support at least twice the axle weight of the largest vehicle that might drive over the cover. It also must support at least two times the weight of employees, equipment, and materials that may be imposed on the cover at any one time. A cover should be well secured to prevent accidental movement and be marked with the word hole or cover. OSHA defines a personal fall arrest system, or PFAS, as a system used to arrest an employee in a fall from a working level. Each component of the system must be able to withstand the amount of impact forces involved with stopping an employee that is falling. The farther an employee falls, the greater the force needed to stop them. Personal fall arrest systems must limit maximum arresting force on an employee to 1,800 pounds. Be rigged so that an employee cannot free fall more than six feet, nor contact any lower level. Bring an employee to a complete stop and limit deceleration distance an employee travels to 3.5 feet. Have sufficient strength to withstand twice the potential impact energy of an employee free falling a distance of 6 feet or the free fall distance permitted by the system, whichever is less. Sustain the employee within the system or strap configuration without making contact with the employee's neck and chin area. Be inspected before each use for wear, damage, and other deterioration. Defective parts must be removed from use. And finally, PFAS must be used, stored, and replaced according to manufacturer's guidelines. Never attach PFASs to guardrails, hoists, or roof edges, or in areas that can cause you to swing. Construction employers are mandated to protect employees from fall hazards and falling objects whenever the employee is six feet or more above a lower level or exposed when working under a level that is six feet or more above the working level the employee is on.
personal fall arrest systems consist of anchorage points, a body harness, lanyards, lifelines, and connectors. An anchorage is a secure point of attachment for lifelines, lanyards, or deceleration devices. Anchorages used for attachment of any PFA equipment must be independent of any anchorage being used to support or suspend platforms. An anchorage must be capable of supporting 5,000 pounds per employee attached or be designed, installed, and used under the supervision of a qualified person as part of a complete PFAS, which maintains a safety factor of two. A qualified person is defined as one with a recognized degree or professional certificate with extensive knowledge and experience in the subject field. The person is capable of design, analysis, evaluation, and specifications in the subject work, project, or product. A body harness is a device of straps worn by an employee in a manner that will distribute fall arrest forces over at least the thighs, pelvis, waist, chest, and shoulders. It must also have a means for attaching it to other components of a personal fall arrest system. Harness straps should make an X on the back and should not be twisted. An attachment point should be located in the center of the wearer's back, near the shoulder level. OSHA limits maximum arresting force on an employee to 1,800 pounds with use of a body harness. Body belts cannot be used as part of a personal fall arrest system. A connector is a device which is used to connect parts of the PFAS and positioning devices together. These include D-rings and snap hooks and must have a minimum breaking point of 5,000 pounds. Connectors must be proof tested to a minimum breaking load of 3,600 pounds without cracking, breaking, or suffering permanent deformation. Snap hooks must be locking type. Unless the snap hook is of a locking type with proper design, they should not be engaged directly to webbing, rope, or wire rope, to each other, to a D-ring to which another snap hook or connector is attached, to a horizontal lifeline, or to any object which is incompatibly shaped or dimensioned such that unintentional disengagement could occur. Lifelines serve as a means of connecting other components of a PFAS to the anchorage. A vertical lifeline is a flexible line for connection to an anchorage at one end to hang vertically. They may only be used by one person and with a rope grab. A horizontal lifeline is a flexible line for connection to an anchorage at both ends to stretch horizontally. It can only be used as part of a complete PFAS and must be designed, installed, and used under the supervision of a qualified person and maintain a safety factor of at least two. Lanyards are devices for connecting the body harness to anchorage point. There are different types of lanyards, shock absorbing, self-retracting, synthetic rope, and synthetic webbing. The lanyard must be made from synthetic fibers and have a minimum breaking point of 5,000 pounds per employee. A shock absorbing lanyard should include deceleration devices to slow a fall and lower trauma to the body. Self-retracting lifelines have a braking mechanism that is applied when the line is extracted too fast. Calculating total fall distance, or TFD, is as necessary and important as using the proper body harness, lanyard, connectors, and anchorage point. TFD is the distance between the anchorage point and closest obstruction. Total fall distance can be found by using the following equation. TFD equals length of lanyard plus deceleration distance, plus height of worker, plus safety factor. Lanyards can range from 18 inches to 6 feet. Deceleration distance should be 3.5 feet, which is the maximum allowed by OSHA. 
height of worker is the distance from the D-ring located on the upper back on the body harness to the working level, which is generally about four to five feet. A safety factor of at least two feet should be used, but three feet is suggested. A controlled access zone is a work area designated and clearly marked in which certain types of work, such as overhand bricklaying, leading edge work, or other operations, may take place without the use of conventional fall protection systems to protect employees working in the zone. Only qualified personnel involved in the operation are allowed to enter the zone. Controlled access zones must be defined by a control line or by any other means that restrict access. Control lines should consist of ropes, wires, tapes, or equivalent material, and should be flagged or clearly marked at not more than six feet intervals with high visibility material. The control line must have a minimum braking strength of 200 pounds. Other restrictions and rules apply. Your employer will provide you with the necessary information if this type of protection is utilized by your company. Another system of protection is the warning line system, which is used mostly on roofs and is designed to warn a worker that they are approaching an unprotected roof side or edge. The warning line designates an area where roofing work may take place without the use of other fall protection systems. The barrier is a warning line consisting of rope, wire, or chains placed at least six feet from leading edge and flagged at six foot intervals with high visibility material. Employees are not allowed between the roof edge and warning line unless performing roof work. Employees performing roofing work between the roof edges and warning line must also be protected by guardrails, nets, PFAS, or safety monitoring system. A safety monitoring system is one that utilizes a competent person to monitor the safety of other employees. The safety monitor must be competent to recognize fall hazards and be able to warn employees when a hazard appears or if the employee is acting in an unsafe manner. The monitor must be on the same working level and within sight of employees being monitored and be close enough to communicate orally with employees. The safety monitor must not have other responsibilities that can take their attention away from monitoring employees. Employees working in a controlled access zone must comply with the safety monitor. The fall protection plan option is only available to employees engaged in leading edge work, precast concrete erection, or residential construction work, where it is unfeasible or creates a greater hazard to use conventional fall protection equipment. A training program is required for all employees who might be exposed to fall hazards. Employers are required to provide information and training to each employee in a manner that the employee understands. Employees must be trained to recognize fall hazards and in procedures to follow to minimize hazards. The training must be performed by a competent and or qualified person who knows the nature of fall hazards in the work area, the correct procedures for assembling, maintaining, disassembly, and inspection of the fall protection systems to be used, the use and operation of all fall protection devices, including fall restraint devices, arresting devices, and any other device that minimizes fall hazards. The role of each employee when implementing the safety monitoring system Limitations of mechanical equipment during the performance of roof work on low sloped roofs. Correct procedures for handling and storage of equipment used for overhead protection. 
and roles of employees in fall protection plans and the standards regulated by OSHA. Employers must prepare current written certification to show a record of each employee trained and should include name or other identification of the employee trained, the dates of training, and the signature of the employer or the person performing the training. Employees should also be retrained when changes to the workplace render previous training obsolete, when changes in the types of fall protection systems or equipment to be used changes, or the employee knowledge of use of fall protection systems or equipment indicate the employee has not retained the required understanding or skill. Falls are a major safety issue, and using the right protection system is necessary to ensure your safety. Fall protection must be used when working on any surfaces more than four feet above a lower level in general industry and six feet in construction industry. Remember the ABCs of personal fall arrest systems, anchorage, body harness, and connectors and how to use all components properly. Always know the total fall distance when using PFASs. Take training seriously, and finally, use all fall protection properly. It may save your life.